But essentially, the Hacker Foundation is a, a 501c3, which is a, a nonprofit in the United States that allows for um, hacker projects to take on a charitable status. So if you run a penetration testing company, for example, you could donate money to the Hacker Foundation and we give it to Metasploit. And they uh, take this money, exactly what you donate to them, and we provide them with infrastructure and you get a nice tax deductible write-off. In addition, we help with other types of projects and depending on what you want to do, we might be able to help you. Um, though since almost everyone in this room is uh, European, it might not be so applicable. It could be useful uh, to take this model and do it in Europe and possibly there are other places that are already doing it this way. And Nick Farr is uh, an old friend of mine known from DEF CON and DEF CON is sort of where the Hacker Foundation grew out of and a lot of the other people that are involved with that uh, are also involved with um, the Hacker Foundation. So uh, without further ado, this is Nick Farr. Uh, thanks again, Jake. Um, I'm Nick Farr, and I'm here to talk about the Hacker Foundation. Uh, just to give a little brief introduction about myself, um, my undergraduate degree is in social science, and while I was at the University of Michigan, um, a lot of the tools and things that we were learning in our uh, social science, um, actually, I'm sorry, I have to, I want to have a timer so I don't go too over on my slides. Um, I did some research on just hacker culture and the sociology of hacker culture. Uh, while I was there and while I was uh, involved in Ann Arbor 2600, the University of Michigan is in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I also did a little bit of research into human computer interaction at the School of Information there. Um, and I just recently received my MBA from Grand Valley State University where I'm also a graduate assistant. I just wanted to say quickly that what I, most of what I'm talking about today is my own opinion and my own speech, it's not to be taken or construed, unless otherwise noted, as the official position of the Hacker Foundation. And the reason I'm wearing this suit is because it makes it very easy for you to find me, because I have not yet found anybody else who's in a full-blown suit um, and tie. So that, that's just to explain that. Oh, I also, most of the Hacker t-shirts that I received as gifts or that I buy at uh, conferences like this, I end up giving away um, at a convention in the Midwest called Nauticon. Uh, which happens in the spring every year. Um, also, the Hacker Foundation has provided no funding for me to attend the conference. Um, I've used personal funds to buy my plane ticket here and other incidental expenses, except for, obviously, the CCC, who gave me free admission to the Congress, and I'm very grateful for that, um, to B9, who threw a fantastic party last night. Uh, it was so great, I was up until 6 o'clock in the morning, I thought, you know, if I try to sleep, it's not going to be good. And I also want to say, you know, Germans know how to do caffeine. I've been living on this stuff. It's great. <laughs> um, I also want to thank my personal friend, uh, Josh Landau, who lent me a, uh, uh, an unlocked GSM cell phone. I did uh, purchase a SIM for it with Hacker Foundation money, and that's the only money that's been used. And that's basically to, facil to facilitate contact uh, between you and me. Um, and I also want to thank Jesse, who's given some of his own personal funds um, to make it so that I could attend the Congress. And I want to thank my fiance, who is allowing me to be here right now. Um, just to give a quick outline, this was uh, in the program for the Congress. The first thing I want to talk about is just sort of where Hacker Foundation came from. The second thing I want to talk about, which I think is really important, is how the Hacker Foundation came into being as a legal entity in the United States. Um, part three is sort of what we've done since then, and then what I really want to do towards the end of it, I want to try to breeze through this to allow some communication uh, just to open up the lines between you and me. Also, I know that a lot of people in the audience are not native English speakers, so if I'm speaking unintelligibly, or if there's a word you don't understand, or I'm just going too fast because I'm shaking because I've had, I think, six of these today, just, just yell out something like, slow down, or speak up, whatever. Um, the Hacker Foundation really sort of started the earliest pinpointed um, origin is at DEF CON 9 where uh, Jesse Krems, who's the head speaker goon, had been the head speaker goon at DEF CON for a long time, uh, just sort of saw my HCI talk that I gave at DEF CON 9 and we got to talking a little bit about, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a Hackers Without Borders, sort of a Medicine Sans Frontier for hackers. 
And just along those lines, we were talking about what can hackers do to provide disaster relief? How can we provide communications to NGOs that might not be good at doing that in a foreign land where there isn't existing communications infrastructure? Um, and then, you know, we, you know, one of my favorite memories of Pac Bell is when after DEF CON 9 was over, we had just a sat phone lying around from Uncle Ira. So we went up to the roof of the Alexis Park and we started playing with it. And that those sort of things sort of got the Hacker Foundation ball sort of rolling. We didn't really do much between DEF CON 9 and 10, but at DEF CON 10, um, we all met at a pizza parlor on day zero of DEF CON 10. And a whole bunch of people were there. A lot of ideas were discussed. I was furiously taking notes um, on everything. Uh, one of the ideas that came out of that that I think is a good idea and that I'd still like to implement somehow, but for various legal and organizational reasons, we haven't found the right way to do it, um, is a hacker benevolent society. The idea being, it's sort of like an insurance plan that people will pay in something like $10 a year. And if they're ever down on their luck, they've lost their job, they can't get a new one for a year, and they need something like a new suit to go on interviews because their old one's trashed, or they need a new laptop or something like that. Uh, those funds that everybody contributes into can be used to purchase those sorts of things to get, you know, help hackers who are in need get back on their feet. And a lot of other ideas were discussed about what should be done. And Priest, who's sort of the head MC of DEF CON, has been for a while, basically said at the end of it, capped everything off by saying, you have to get organized. You have to actually go out, do the legal research, talk with the government, and actually, you know, start an organization. And, you know, part two, that's what happened. Um, Hacker Foundation is a nonprofit organization registered in the state of California. Corporations in the United States have to be registered with their state. And then once they get state registration, uh, they then go uh, apply or they, for their various um, federal exemptions or they elect certain things. And we submitted the application to the state of California something in July of 2003. And <laughs> and it took till December for them to say, okay, yeah, this looks fine, you're good. Um, it was Jesse and I who put our names on the application for the California Corporation and um, on the IRS application. Uh, later on, we realized that we needed to have a board of directors because two people can't run a foundation that's supposed to represent hackers. So right now, our board of directors um, is international. We have, a board, we have a board member who lives in the United Kingdom. Uh, we have board members who are on the East Coast, West Coast, in New England, and uh, in the Midwest. Uh, I live in Grand Rapids, which is three hours away from Chicago, and two of our board members are in Chicago. Um, after we got um, approval from the state of California, Jesse and I started working on the application for 501c3 status, which is basic charity. 501c3s can't do political activism. They're not a religious organization. They're uh, the standard charitable status for organizations in the United States. And, uh, you know, I flew out to Vermont where Jesse lives and we were sitting there, we were doing the application, running the numbers, trying to explain, uh, you know, what the Hacker Foundation was doing. And so, of course, the IRS writes us back and says, um, no. So, they, in one of, some of the questions that they ask are, well, you know, this Hacker Foundation idea sounds a little bit sketchy. I mean, why do hackers need a foundation? You know, what are you doing as far as educational and research activities? That a lot of the stuff we are describing in the eyes of the IRS um, looked like for-profit activities, which obviously a charity can't engage in as their sole purpose. Um, and so they asked us to explain, well, what do you mean by nonprofit educational activities? How are you not going to make a profit from this? One of the sticking points they had is, what do you mean by the free flow of information? And in doing the research for the response, um, when you say free flow of information that has certain political connotations to it, and as a 501c3, you can't really engage in certain kinds of political action, that the language is sort of vague right there. So they wanted us to clarify that. You know, another thing they said, but sort of between the lines is, how is this different from a dot-com? Are you just doing this to basically escape your taxation obligations in the United States? And if you make a profit from whatever things you're going to be doing, how are those going to be used? And, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. The IRS is the, <laughs> the IRS is the Internal Revenue Service. They're the federal taxation authority in the United States. So they, they do taxes for the entire country of the United States. Uh, most people in the United States pay taxes in two ways, based on their income. They pay a portion of it to their state in most states, and then they pay a larger portion of that to the federal government for defense and roads and other evil things. Uh, 
<laughs> wars, exactly. Um, God, I hope they're not watching the speech. Uh, and so what I, what I tried to phrase the response back to the IRS is saying, and I, I, I didn't use the language hacker, hacker ethic, but if you were to read um, the PDF both from the IRS and our response to them, which I have available um, if anybody wants, uh, a lot of what I was saying was right in the line with what you would look at as the hacker ethic as embodied in the Hacker Manifesto. Um, what we were saying is that there is a role for a charity to create, you know, sort of technical solution sort of hacks to help people in need in a lot of different ways. Um, a couple of the, pro the theoretical projects that I mentioned that the Hacker Foundation might want to do, um, one was called Opsomidriro. Uh, basically what it was is it's using toy technology to create mind-detecting robots that were built in a way so that when they actually detect a mind, they would go over it, and then the impact of the mind would be absorbed, the body of it would blow apart into various different bits, but they'd all be tethered together so that the, somebody out in the field could basically scoop up the robot, put it back together, and then send it out to go find another mine. Another uh, project that we were doing that other people are, are in the United States have done since then is taking old cellular phones um, that can dial emergency services and then taking them to elderly who don't get out of their house very much, who might have trouble summoning assistance, and then teaching them how to use these cell phones to dial for help so that they don't have to pay a private provider to provide a basically identical service. Um, one of the big emphases that I wanted to point out with this was that all of these solutions that we were advocating would be essentially free to the user. They would rely primarily on donated technology, donated expertise, donated volunteer time for training and things like that, um, and provide these services to people at no charge. It's something that, uh, you know, trying to find services that people were getting charged for that we could come in with the open source or free technology to try to find a way to reduce that cost uh, to the end user. When I tried to explain free flow of information to the IRS, I, didn't, I tried to phrase it in the least political terms possible, that what we said was all we were trying to do is create open channels for people to do something with. And whatever people ended up doing with them was of their own choice. You know, if people wanted access to a blog, they could talk about their boring life, they could talk about communism, they could talk about how George Bush is great. The Hacker Foundation would have nothing to do with it. All we were trying to do is open that channel. And some of the examples I gave you know, were establishing free nets, tin can networks um, that piggyback off of freely provided internet services in the United States, the cell phone example I gave, and just general open source advocacy. You know, telling people that they don't need to go out and buy a copy of Microsoft Office to write letters to their grandchildren or to balance their checkbook. Um, that they can use OpenOffice, which I'm using to give this presentation right now. The, the whole mean about free flow of information was the classical um, GNU definition, free speech, not free beer. Another thing that I, that I tried to hit on in my response to the IRS was that anything that we developed or anything that a project that HF sponsored developed or anything like that had to be open for public use had to be open in the most classical way possible. That any patents or research that might be developed by HF or by an HF project would be held so that other people couldn't patent it and profit off of it. Another thing that's very important that hacker groups in the United States, as opposed to Germany, have a big problem with is being sustainable. Um, you know, just like when we started the Hacker Foundation, we had unrealistic goals of trying to be this transnational communications special ops team. That wasn't going to happen overnight. That wasn't realistic. It wasn't a sustainable model. So what we tried to do is we tried to say to projects who apply to us, you have to have something that's re more realistic, something that's well within your grasp to do. You have to have achievable timetables, and it has to be developed in an environment that invites collaboration as opposed to stifles it. Um, am I going too fast? Or does anybody have any questions so far? Anything? Okay. Um, a couple of the projects that HF have, has been involved in so far, which you know failed by our own standards. Uh, the first one that I, I really like to point out is SurvivorLocationAssistance.org. This project emerged in the wake of the tsunamis, um, and what we were trying to do is provide a way for NGOs and other people to have a central repository.